I'm Jim Moskovitz, the executive producer of The James Brown Show, and I'm in Las Vegas stepping in for JB. Remember the book and movie, The Blind Side, about the Baltimore Ravens' brilliant left tackle, Michael Orr? Well, today's featured guest was the first to play that position for the Ravens. In fact, after being the new franchise's first draft pick in 1996, he went on to become the greatest left tackle in NFL history. Football Hall of Famer Jonathan Ogden. Now tell me about your start in football. You know, I was just always attracted to the line. I mean, I was just a big guy who like to hit people and got, you know, it's kind of a contest of who could be the most dominant person. And that kind of just drew me in early. I, you know, at that age, at seventh grade, I like to play defense a little more than offense, I think, just because of the nature of the fame that you got from making the tackle or trying to get that sack. But I learned early that I was probably a better offensive lineman. I really understood that I was probably going to be, at the eighth grade, ninth grade, high school level, a dominant offensive lineman. Why right tackle, not left tackle to begin with? It was just kind of where they put me. They said, let's start you out at right tackle. And uh, growing up in the D.C. area with the Hogs, you had Joe Jacoby and Lachey, so to me it didn't really matter. Well, I can tell you, in college is when I first really understood the difference between right and left tackle. Now, let's talk about those hands. How does that play in to being a tackle, yes. the hands? It's more about hand placement, honestly. It's about offensive line is a lot about technique and about being in the right position and hand placement. So if I want to put my hands on your shoulder pads in order to control you. I've got to know how to place them right and not let you knock them off. So it's, a, it's basically a karate match. It's a hand chopping match in there. So you have to have good, solid, strong hands at the same time, but you have to have supple hands too because you have to be able to move them fast. And you, of course, were an All-American in both track and field and in football in high school at St. Albans. Yes. So, so tell us about how you, you got introduced to discus and shot put. You know, when my uh, seventh and eighth grade football coach also happened to be the coach of the track and field team. <laughs> so he said, you know what, Jonathan, you know, if you come out here and try to throw this shot in discus, this will help your explosiveness, your power, your speed, all these things that are going to translate over to the football field. So I said, well, sure, why not, coach? And it was just something I immediately took to the way you have to utilize your bodies, the control and the strength and the power that it was required to throw that implement, either the shot or disc really far. It's just something that not a lot of people have and I just kind of took to it immediately. It's a pleasure talking with you about these beginnings. You were recruited by so many colleges. Yes. Uh, you were an outstanding student and, of course, a terrific football player and, and track and field star and All-American in both. Tell me about your decision between the University of Florida and UCLA, where you attended. I had told every school that I visited that if you wanted to have a chance of signing me that once I became established as a starter or a second stringer on the football team, which is where my scholarship was going to be, obviously, that I wanted to pursue track and field during the spring. So they all agreed to that. And so it kind of came down to Florida and UCLA. And Steve Spurrier was a really just suave, convincing, just salesman. I mean, he really sold the Gators. I mean, it was really close. But one thing that they didn't have that UCLA had was they just didn't have the everything that comes with being in Los Angeles. They flew me out there and they didn't take me up the 405. They took me down PCH to go to the school. They took me to Gladstones, you know, the restaurant on the, on the uh, Pacific Ocean. And I just understood that, I just felt that going and spending four years in Los Angeles would be a better experience for me than going to Gainesville, Florida. And also the track and field program was superior at UCLA. So I felt that I'd have a better chance to develop into perhaps potentially an Olympic level shot putter at UCLA. Your track coach was kind of a tough guy though. Well, yes, I had a guy, Art Venegas, who was world class, coached a lot of world record holders. And uh, I appreciated that though, because he was a guy who didn't, who's no nonsense. And he actually was one of the first coaches who really challenged me to get the best out of me. He almost wanted me to quit track and field because he didn't feel that I was giving it enough attention and effort when I was out there. He understood that I had to play football, but he wanted me to be focused when I was there. And once we had that conversation, I mean, I was a whole different athlete. I was focused on everything I had to do for both sports. Well, you became an All-American in track and field, and you won the NCAA Division I championship in the shot put. Yeah, I did. Indoor, my senior year, I was uh, fortunate enough to get a PR, personal best, uh, by about a foot and a half. And I felt really bad because my teammate, who was the favorite, 
he actually was, we were flying to Indianapolis on the airplane back in the day when they had the carts pushing down the aisle. And he had his foot stuck in the aisle and he got hit by the cart and he bruised his foot badly. And he was by far the favorite. He used to beat me all the time in practice. But when he got hurt, I said, Mark, I got you. I'm going to go in there and take it down for the Bruins. And it was, it was the best throw of my life. And I'll always remember that, that moment. Now, please tell us about your move, your huge move from right tackle to left tackle at UCLA. Yeah, you know what, it was, it was kind of strange because in high school, like I said, I always played right tackle. And when we got there as, a, as freshmen, they just they started me at right tackle initially. I did well at right tackle, I did fine. Then they said, well, let's just try you out on the left side. Let's see what you can do. And for some reason, I don't know why, it just made sense. Blocking, the body motion and everything on the left side made sense to me. So they told me, so, you know, we think we're gonna move you to left tackle. So I was just kind of like, okay. <laughs> and so I went home after that practice and I called my dad and I said, you know what, dad, they're gonna move me to the left side. And he said, son, that's where the money is at the next level. So that's what you really wanted at the end of the day. So I was like, okay then, <laughs> let's just make this left thing work out then. If you're playing on the West Coast, the Rose Bowl is the place to be. Can you, can you share that with us? You made the Rose Bowl and what was that experience like? First of all, it's the best grass that I've ever played football on, all the NFL stadiums included. And just the atmosphere and the history that go with being out there is just second to none. And I just was so thankful that that was our home and we got to defend it. And like I said, we didn't win as many games as I would have liked to when we were at UCLA, but we really, I think we did the school proud. We'll be back with Hall of Famer Jonathan Ogden after this. his way to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Jonathan Ogden was a first or second team All-Pro nine times and a Pro Bowler 11 times. He says, as an offensive lineman, you're defined by your screw-ups much more than your great efforts. The only time we hear our name over the stadium speakers is when we jumped too early or held somebody. So I focused much more on my bad plays. Now, tell us about that, Jonathan, because you can have 35 great plays do everything perfectly and but you seem to be focused on learning from that one play i mean it's true i mean you could throw the ball 40 times a game but if you give up one sack each game that's 16 sacks you gave up and i mean percentage wise that sounds small but that's a lot to give up so you really have got to focus on being perfect especially on the offensive lineman side as a defensive player you could get blocked 90 percent of the time but you make two sacks the guy had a tremendous game. What an impact he had on the game. So in order to be a successful offensive lineman, it's more about just kind of like just grinding ahead, just not really worrying about what people are saying and just focusing on your job. Now, when you were looking at film, were you more focused on the prat nah, balls? I mean, you looked at the good ones. <laughs> you, there are a couple times where you knew, like, for example, me and Evan Mutalo, our left guard, we had this one combination block once upon a time. We hit this dude so hard, his feet flipped up in the air, and we would sit there in the meeting and rewind it, like watch this like four or five times, and just watch the guy's feet flip over in the air. I mean, you gotta have fun and enjoy it because you're out there to try to physically dominate somebody. You did have some experiences in getting the ball, of course. Was that an especially exciting moment to, to have the ball in your hands? When they put me out there at tight end, okay, there were two times when I was a tight end on the short yardage goal line package, so, I was able to get out there and catch a couple touchdown passes and show my skills. And the funny thing is, in the meeting, like after we, when I had those touchdowns, I'd always be bragging to all the boys in the offensive line, like, if they would do this more often, we win more games. You gotta get me the ball, because I make plays. <laughs> you know, anytime we get a chance to catch the ball, especially at that level, you just relish it, enjoy it, because you know it doesn't happen very often as a lineman. Tell me about Gilbert Brown, the grave digger, the nose tackle for the Packers and your experience with him. It was an important rookie experience. Yes, it was. That was uh, what I call my welcome to the NFL moment. <laughs> I want to say it was a preseason game. My rookie, I was playing offense. I was playing a guard at the time. I wasn't even tackle. And Steve Ever and I had a combination block going up to the linebacker, and my job was to secure Gilbert Brown. So I'm thinking, okay, let me just hit him and just move him out the way. How hard can this be? 
Well, I hit this big man. He puts an arm under my armpit. He throws me all 320 pounds, me to the ground, hits the running back right on top of me, tackles him and falls on me, then stands up and does the grave digger right on my head. And I'm just like, okay, <laughs> this is what the NFL is like, young man. But I, I regrouped and I, and I got him blocked a couple times the next. But uh, I think everybody has that moment where you just are like, this is a different level. This is a different game. Okay, so tell us about that. Specifically, what are the different elements? Of course, there's that intimidating presence, but, but how about the athletic skills? The biggest difference in the NFL is that everybody is good. In college, I used to tell people this, in college I could have freaking had a snack in one hand and block them with the other. But at the NFL level, everybody can make a play if you're not on top of your game. So you really got to be just sharp and ready to go because that guy can make you look bad. We'll be back with the Hall of Famer, Jonathan Ogden, after this. I'm here with Jonathan Ogden, whose Baltimore Ravens demolished the New York Giants in Super Bowl 35, 34 to 7 in 2001. The Giants Hall of Fame defensive end Michael Strahan has said Ogden was a laugher. You see him smiling and think to yourself that this guy is not mean enough to handle the mean pass rushers in the NFL. But Jonathan would rip your limbs off and then he'd laugh. Is that true, Jonathan? <laughs> Well, I mean, I wouldn't quite rip them all the way off. I might, like, contort it a little bit and, and then, like, give it back to you. <laughs> but, you know, I, I always try to have fun with the game. I always try to enjoy what I did. I mean, I was good at it. They said you pay us to practice, but we play the games on, uh, for free on Sunday. Well, I try to go out there and enjoy Sunday. Now, let's go back, though, to the beginnings with Baltimore because you yes. thought that you were going to be drafted by the Arizona Cardinals yes. and you were picked of course in the first round but you thought that you would be the third pick yes. and not the fourth in the first round. Well you know all the experts the Mel Kuypers of the world uh, at the time were saying Arizona Cardinals Arizona Cardinals and my agent at the time was saying the exact same thing the night before the draft we were talking to the Arizona Cardinals and a funny story Jim Fossil who was the offensive coordinator at the time for the Arizona Cardinals, who also came to Baltimore and lives here as a neighbor of mine, he was telling me a story about that draft. He was saying that the night before the draft, they were all set to pick me, and then all of a sudden he got a call around midnight saying they were going with Simeon Rice, and he got irritated and that <laughs> he wanted me badly. So I didn't know all this at the time, obviously. So we're in the green room in New York City. First pick goes off Keyshawn Johnson. Okay, fine. Second pick, Kevin Hardy. We expect that. Third pick is supposed to be me. So we're in the green room, the phone rings, the guy picks up and answers the phone. So I'm about ready to get up. And he's like, Simeon Rice. So I'm like, let me sit back down, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I guess there is a lot of things that happen in the draft like they say. And so then I was looking at the next team on the clock and it was Baltimore and I took a trip to Baltimore. It was more out of courtesy at the time because I was on the East Coast to see the Jets who had the first pick and the Giants who were the fifth pick and I came down to Baltimore to visit them because I was here. But they had had a solid offensive line at the time. So when they called my name and Ozzy, you know, I picked up the phone and he was like, it was Ozzy Newsom, you ready to be a Baltimore Raven? I was a little shocked because we had no real understanding who the Ravens were. They gave me a hat that with black letters, with white letters and a black jacket that said Baltimore Ravens. There was no emblem, no anything. But at the time, I was excited just being in the NFL. Didn't really matter. So, so tell us about your introduction to the city. And I know you've been embraced so much for so many years. And, uh, and how does that feel? Yeah, I mean, Baltimore, when I got there, I just didn't realize how great a town it is. The people are caring and hardworking, blue collar. They love their families. They love their football teams and, and well, their sports, all their sports they have there. You know, the city itself has gone through some ups and downs. But the spirit has always been so really just strong and the support that they've given the Ravens over the past, you know, from 1996 to today, it's just been unparalleled. I don't think any other organizations, any other cities support their teams as well as Baltimore does the Ravens. It was shocking how quickly that young team made the Super Bowl. It, it really was. I mean, our first couple years, first two, three years, we were 4-12, 6-9-1, and one, but it, we were building fast. We were drafting myself, then we drafted Peter Bowlware and Ray Lewis the same year. We drafted a Chris McCallister, so we go get a Tony Saragusa in free agency. So we were really throwing together. Ozzie Newsom was putting the pieces together fast. And by that fifth year in 2001, 
when we were in the Super Bowl, it didn't even seem that long because of how well the organization was run. We will be back with Hall of Famer Jonathan Ogden after this. Back with Jonathan Ogden. Jonathan, your mother was very involved with philanthropic activity. In fact, that was her career. What impact did that have in the Jonathan Ogden Foundation and how you supported academic excellence among athletes, young athletes, football players? Yeah, my mother was, so she is a lawyer, and education has always been so important in my life, becoming the person who I am. And I always thought that the combination of academics and athletics together were very powerful. They have a lot of things that take you to the same places in life. And so what I did was I tried to find a club find the kids who really needed the help the most, but the kids who also wanted the help. And we try to do tutoring programs, life skill programs, college visits, try to do things to get these kids who've never had a chance to get outside of Baltimore, give them a chance to do something with themselves. It's my little small part, but I really feel proud and honored to be able to do it. Terrific, now golf is also very important to you. <laughs> Now, I know you missed this last Pebble Beach Pro-Am, yes. but you wanted to go there. Yes. So uh, tell me about the importance of, of golf to you. And I know a lot of football players have trouble in actually controlling that ball. Well, you know what it is, is playing football for so long is the ultimate team game. It really is, you know, 11 guys working together to achieve a common goal, which is great. But golf is just you and that little ball. And it just looks at you, and I swear it's laughing at me every day. <laughs> the good thing I like about it is if I hit a good shot, it's on me. But if I hit a bad shot, it's on me as well. And the competition that I get to still feel without actually hitting anyone, <laughs> you know, I still enjoy that. So that kind of has been able to feel that competitive fire that I still have. What are your strengths in golf? My strengths are kind of, you'd be surprised, my short game. I got nice soft hands, you know, kind of like when I was playing football, I can still get that ball up and down around the green. But the biggest problem with golf is the inconsistency. One day you can drive it well, but the irons are off, or vice versa. This, it never all comes together on the same day. You guys out there know what I'm talking about. It's got to come together at the same time. <laughs> now, does it come together frequently for you? Not as frequently as I would like. I've managed to maintain about a 8-9 handicap. So I have my days when I can go Excellent. out there and shoot 75, Excellent. 76, yeah. and then I go out there and shoot 90, and I'm just like, why do I do this? Now, tell us about the future of the Ravens, the way that you see it today. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, John Harbaugh's still there right now, and he's been a great coach for 11 years. We'll see how it goes with him. If he stays, great. If not, you know, it would be a kind of a mutual thing. But I'm curious to see how this Lamar Jackson quarterback experiment is going to work out. I think that... I've never been a huge fan of quarterbacks who run as their first weapon, but if it's something that you use as a supplement to, where, to your skills, then it could be great. And he is probably one of the most electric runners I've seen since Michael Vick at the quarterback position, but he needs to learn how to operate in the pocket or he's going to get hurt. So if he can become that guy, the Ravens' future looks really bright because they got a couple good offensive, young offensive linemen. They got a couple good defensive backs who are young, and uh, I'm really, I'm really happy with them right now. Outside of the Ravens, who else do you admire in the NFL today? I, you know, I admire the old guys who were still playing when I was still there. I mean, uh, Tom Brady, uh, Drew Brees, uh, Antonio Gates. Some of the younger guys. I like uh, watching Mahomes uh, has been playing great for Kansas City. Um, outside of that, though. You know, I, I root for the old guys. <laughs> you know, if I played against you, then you're all right, you're all right with me. Jonathan, thank you so much. It's no, been a real pleasure. You. No, very. I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you well, very much. Greatly appreciate your being here. I am grateful to my guest, Hall of Famer Jonathan Ogden, and invite you to the next James Brown Show. <laughs>